Hey everyone, Chris from Military Aviation History and today I thought I'd talk about the German Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. Why? Well, once again I have a fantastic file here from the German military archive going through the full breakdown of how a Ju-87 mission is prepared, well first planned, then prepared and then executed. And that is of course done in conjunction with a ground offensive and that gives us a fantastic insight into how these aircraft were supposed to be used because out there, there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to the Stuka. Now that's reason number one of why I'm doing this video. Reason number two, purely capitalist nature. Reminder, all of you crowdfunded, of course, our new book, Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber. Link in the description below if you're interested. Uh, this book is has been completely funded by all of you blowing for all the stretch goals last year and we are set to achieve our shipping date February, March, most likely with COVID restriction mark March 2022. The orders are still open until the end of the month. Then we're going to lock it, send out all the early copies to our supporters and uh, later on it will be once again available in general sale. But if you want it soon, you better get it now. Now that's going to be just stand there prominently displaying my own flags here. Uh, it could be worse, it could be a bag of Doritos, couldn't it? Um, not a sponsor. Now, the document that I'm using today is not in the book, but that's because this is a virtual bonus for all of you. But enough of that, that. what about this German file? Well, this is, comes from November 1943, and it is part of uh, instructional documents used at the Luftwaffe Air War Colleges or the Luftwaffe Akademien, where new officers were being trained. So really, this is a primary document that really breaks it down nicely and that can really be used as an authority to show how these missions were being planned. So let's just do that. Uh, I think you are as excited as I am. This is of course sort of the primary source document that you only get on this channel. So let's get going. The situation is described as follows. There is a front line that runs from the east, passing various cities, over to the west, where it follows the course of a river. A stalemate exists between blue and red forces. Red forces have more fighter aircraft in the area, whom are flying defensive patrols to protect their rear installation and the front lines. But they have also mounted regular bombing attacks against blue logistics and infrastructure Blue fighters are unable to attain anything more than local temporary air superiority. By the way, I won't be using the town or city names here just to keep things simple. But in case you really are interested, this is supposed to be Dresden, this is Leipzig and the river is the Unstrut. Maybe you live in that area. In which case, hello, greetings to Germany, yeah? With an offensive push then, Blue plans to cross the river in the west, take the fortification line on the opposite bank and use the Panzer and the motorized infantry divisions to push onwards towards the north before turning towards the east and threaten the main red force. Once that happens, the main army is set to advance. One group of dive bombers and fighters have been ordered to support the operation. The following information now has been made available to the Blue Forces based on reconnaissance and intelligence information. The defensive line on the opposite bank of the river includes a small hill on which at least two bunkers and light fortification works have been identified, as well as an artillery position. An incomplete minefield is also assumed to be in the area. As for air defense, strong light and heavy flak has been reported to be stationed on the hill and northwards of the river, specifically also covering the artillery positions. Now then, let's look at the order of battle for this operation, focusing primarily on the Blue Air Force. For this operation, a full group of dive bombers has been made available. The operational readiness numbers for aircraft and crew are shown here for each duffel. The group had three days of rest and is composed out of 50% very experienced crews, 25% of crews have some combat experience and the rest has no combat experience whatsoever. Morale is generally described as good.
Because there is no new weather front rushing in, the meteorological report makes the assumption that the next day is going to be very much the same. Potential ground haze in the morning, which might make it a little bit more difficult finding those targets. But overall, it looks like it's going to be a quite a sunny, clear day. As well as that, the wind, which is very important for the Stukas, of course, when dropping their bombs, will be coming from 180 to 230 degrees, uh, which means that the Stukas if they come directly from the front lines are going to be throwing with the wind and if they're going to fly over the target and then dive from the northeast they're going to throw into the wind. Uh, so those are the two potential options. You always want to be throwing with or against the wind. And uh, the wind speed is set to be between 15 to uh, uh, 15 kph at sea level and 40 kph at 5000 meters. So not perfect but very much manageable. Manageable. Manageable, there we go, manageable. Now with the preparatory information covered, let's look at the attack orders. I will be quoting directly here from the document. 60th Infantry Division will force the crossing of the river at 0520 hours, takes the hill, eliminates the defensive emplacements and takes the towns, thus creating the basis for the following panzer and motorized formations to make the penetration. Regarding this penetration here, shameless plug for our last two books. I swear this is relevant, just bear with me for a second. If you have the 1944 German Army regulation for the medium tank platoon and or have the 1944 pamphlet on the assault platoon using the Sturmgewehr 44, the SG44, then have a look in the glossary of these two books because there we actually show that the Germans make a conceptual difference between the Einbruch and the Durchbruch, which we translate into break-in and penetration. The break-in is the result of a successful attack that breached into the enemy's foremost lines. The penetration is the continuation of the break-in. The objective is to break the cohesion of the enemy front. If you want them, link is in the description below, but back to the orders. The dive bombers support with all forces the attack of the 60th Infantry Division with a simultaneous attack on the main enemy emplacements around the hill just prior to the attack as well as rolling attacks of smaller forces in parallel to the ongoing combat operations on targets that present themselves. In the attacks between 0517 to 0519 hours, the concrete bunkers A and B, the small combat emplacement C, and the artillery emplacement D, and destroys them. Now, if you're enjoying this content, you could be supporting it via Patreon or channel memberships if you want to do so. You will be getting sneak peeks, early access to videos, as well as that we have a Discord server where you can talk to like-minded people, very knowledgeable people. We have a fantastic crowd over there. And we also have regular meetups where we talk about, well, mainly planes, but sometimes also just plain old life, which is always fun as well. So if that is something you're interested in, check it out in the description below. And if not, don't worry. There's other ways to support channels just like mine. For example, you could be doing that whole YouTube voodoo magic algorithm thingy by either hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, of course, hitting that bell notification as well. And also sharing this very video. Yes, sharing this very video with your social circle. It's very low effort, but it has a high impact and it's absolutely fantastic support. So if you want to do that, Thank you very much. Word of mouth is always appreciated. And this is why I think that this document is such a brilliant basis of tackling those misconceptions that exist about the JU-87s that mainly are to this very day rehashed, for example, in uh, documentaries, right? So the main confusion that I see out there about the JU-87 during World War II or its use during World War II is that, yes, while it is often, of course, used in conjunction with combat on the ground, it is not, unlike what is often said, it is not a close air support aircraft. The Germans did not consider the Ju-87 to be an aircraft that provides unmittelbare Luftunterstützung. So that's immediate direct air support. That's a very loose translation there, but essentially close air support, right? The Ju-87 was from the beginning conceptualized to be part of the bomber force. In fact, the targets that it has lined out in the 1939, for example, instructional booklets on how this aircraft was supposed to be used is the, are, is the exact same list of targets as the bombers have, plus an additional set of targets like, for example, bridges that are too hard to destroy for bombers due to accuracy reasons, right? The 
Germans conceptualized the Stuka to operate in what they call the Taktischer Raum, the tactical area. Uh, this is essentially an area that expands from 30 to 100 kilometers from the front lines. The area zero, or at the front lines, 230 kilometers from the front lines, that was called the Gefechtsfeld, the combat area. Yeah? And in fact, if you know contemporary air doctrine, especially sort of NATO air doctrine, you'll recognize that actually this is very similar to how uh, Western countries break it down into close air support, air interdiction, and then of course that flux state, which is battlefield air interdiction, which depending on how you conceptualize or define it, always seems to jump between one instance and the other, right? So anyway, that, enough being said about that. The Stukas were so closely linked to the bombers, in fact, that in one 1939 uh, document, they were even referred to as the snipers amongst the bombers. And that 1939 document, that volume of documents, is actually the precursor to this volume of documents. There were only two editions made, 1939 edition as well as the 1943 edition. So these really, once again, are authoritative sources. Now, of course, JU-87s were sometimes used in full view and in conjunction with the boots on the ground. Absolutely. But the JU-87 would generally do so in a very set-piece manner. It would, for example, open up the attack, dropping bombs just before the infantry assaults a position in order to suppress the enemy, surprise the enemy, take out certain positions and make the attack easier. And after that, after having dropped its bombs, it would then fly back to the airfield, rearm, refuel, and then leave the front lines more or less alone and go after artillery positions, uh, logistical centers, communication hubs, command centers, or reserves being rushed into the front lines, enemy reserves, of course, preferably. And that would be the job of the Stuka after the initial assault. The close air support role amongst the Luftwaffe ranks were given to the Schlachtflieger, which is something that the Germans start out with very few aircraft. They have like 40 Schlachtflieger, Henscher 123s, uh, in Poland. And then of course, by 1943, the Stukas are essentially, at the end of 1943, the Stukas are essentially completely phased out from, uh, from doing what they were supposed to be doing before that because it just doesn't work anymore and the focke 190 comes in as a Schlachtflieger. And in fact there is another lecture from a completely different document and I'm just adding this here as an emphasis once again that also makes that distinction and that really show, clearly shows how the Stuka is different to the Schlachtflieger which does close air support. And ironically it's, it's also about a river crossing. I guess that's a good example. Employment of the air units. Stuka formations dive on the enemy emplacement on the opposite side of the river. The infantry put their boats into the water, while at the same time Schlachtflieger approach at low altitude and used guns and bombs where enemy resistance flares up. They shoot and throw right in front of the boots of the friendly infantry. Now, yes, there, for example, with the D5 variant, the Stuka started to switch over to more low-level attacks, although it was very quickly then substituted by the FW-190. And of course, you have the uh, Bordkanone 73, no, not 73, 37. I switched those numbers around again, from coming from German to English, uh, which is, of course, used in an anti-tank role. But that was mainly used against Soviet army that had penetrated the German lines rather than really being used in a close air support role in the way we think about it nowadays. So beyond these sort of set piece engagements that we're talking about, especially with this file, the Stuka really is not conducting any sort of close air support during World War II at all. Anyway, now let's go through the practical preparations for the attack. So we have uh, the question of how much fuel these Stukas have to carry, what bomb load they're going to be using, and uh, how the Staffeln are going to be split up depending on the targets. What's that you say? You are excited to talk about fuel loads and fuel calculations? Well, you're in luck. The JU-87 that we're using in this example is the D variant. It looks very similar to the one that I'm showing you right now. That's from the RAF Museum in London Hendon. Great place to visit as well. Do check it out. And that aircraft is of course equipped with the Jumo 211J engine. There's also a full tour on this bird available on the channel if you're interested. The D variant has a lot more fuel than the B variant, which was very handicapped when it comes to range. Yeah, the D variant stands at 780 liters. 
That means that with a fuel consumption, at least this is what the fuel consumption rate that the file has is of 270 liters an hour, you have just under three hours of flight time. However, when I read that figure, I got a little bit suspicious because 270 liters an hour seems a little bit low. I checked once again in the JU87D manual and there the average consumption rate is actually quoted with 310 liters power. Maybe there's an additional uh, margin of error added here in here just in the manual to provide yeah, that, that safety margin, I just don't know. However, for this file, since it's going with the 270 liters an hour uh, consumption rate, I'm going to stay with that figure just to keep in line with the general assumptions being made here. But just know that there is a little bit of a divide. Of course, you know this fuel consumption rates very much depend on details like altitude, mixture setting, throttle settings, uh, even the load that you're carrying, la di ya di ya di ya. Um, but we're staying with, easy to use averages here and actually in the field the group did the exact same thing they just use easy to use averages because you don't have time or interest or just don't need to really sketch out the exact fuel consumption every single time you're just going to use simple averages like this 270 liters an hour uh, figure that we have right here now after takeoff the planes climb to 3500 meters based on the estimate this takes about 18 minutes Meeting with the escorts and setting up the formation, a further 10 minutes, and then a final climb to 4,000 meters while flying towards the target and the dive attack in itself is another 10 minutes. Finally, the return flight is about 12 minutes. In total, the flight, attack and return take 50 minutes then. A 20% margin of error is added. Then we add an additional 30 minutes for takeoff, delays, traffic patterns, setting up the formation, landing approaches, or even flying to other airfields if required. This leaves us with a full flight time of 90 minutes and at 270 liters an hour at an easy to calculate 410 liters in total. So for this mission, you actually don't even have to fill up the full tank, but I would assume they would do that anyway because they know they have additional missions later on in the day when they're supporting the ground offensive that is happening. So I would assume that they're filling up those tanks just to save a little bit of time, or rather not time, but effort when the JU-87s are coming back to, uh, to be rearmed and refueled. But now the question then of course is, uh, with the fuel side covered, what bombs are being used. And the question is not actually what bombs are being used, but the question is what targets are you attacking? Because that really is the deciding factor of what bombs you're going to be using. Now, remember, what did we have? We had two concrete bunkers, we had one lighter fortification work, and we had a somewhat dispersed artillery position in here. So those are the targets that we were working with. Uh, we have three Staffeln in the Gruppe, and we have one command flight with three aircraft. And I would actually assume that the command flight with those three aircraft would go for the least important target or maybe the smallest target uh, amongst those four targets. That is exactly what the file is also saying. Vierte and fünfte Staffel attack the concrete bunkers with high explosive bombs. These SC bombs have a high explosive filler to weight ratio of 55% and are sometimes referred by the German as Minenbomben, mine bombs, due to their explosive blast. The same loadout applies to the command flight, the Stab, and the sechste Staffel uses high explosive fragmentation bombs and lighter cluster bombs since their targets, well, their target is an artillery position, so this makes sense. Of course, in the meantime, the fighter gruppe, the Jagd gruppe, also goes through its preparation, does its all fuel calculation, does its route, does its planning, and so on and so forth. But we're sticking with the Stukas for now. Now, as the preparations then are completed, uh, one important element of this, of course, missing, and that is accurate descriptions, accurate pictures, photographic pictures, uh, charts, schematics of the target. Yeah, yeah. And this is really something, once again, it doesn't get often talked about, but it is something that every single experience report you will find, well, maybe not every single, but let's say 90% of experience reports you will find from Stuka Gruppen, every Definitely every single instructional booklet or um, pamphlet that I found on the Luftwaffe, on the Stuka Gruppen says the same thing. You need accurate, up-to-date photographic information of the target or you need at least a vague schematic or something where Stuka pilots can look at it in advance, maybe even take it into the cockpit and then check as they're flying at, let's say, 4,000 meters. Is that the target? Are we there yet? Yes, that is the target. Let's go. Because at the kind of altitudes you're operating at, it's going to be very difficult to find your target based on vague vocal descriptions. And even though the Germans also sometimes used people on the ground, Luftwaffe officers often 
phoning in or not phoning and radioing in where the targets are that of course helps but again it's not the equivalent of having a pre-planned sort of picture with an exact sort of circle hit this and then finding that layout on the ground and then knowing exactly where you have to drop your bombs that just doesn't compare and especially at 3,000 to 5,000 meters you really need to have a schematic outline you're not going to be really able to find individual tanks all the time for example so it's 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 just a technical as well as a practical uh, limitation of this aircraft that we really need to recognize. So in the evening before this operation then uh, reconnaissance information is being supplied to the Gruppe at the hands of schematics and in fact we can have a look at the schematics right here because they're supplied with the file. Um, it's a chart here that you can see the general area uh, plus a sketched image then from the targets um, you, you need to keep in mind as you're looking at this, you know, as an instructional example, this is very nice to look at, but in reality, you would probably unlikely get something that is like this. Uh, photographs or quick sketches made by the reconnaissance planes are going to be way more likely. Once again, I also want to thank at this point actually patrons and channel members who support these trips that I do to the archives. Uh, recently, uh, some longtime viewers might notice that there was initially always an issue with the German military archive having quite prohibitive sort of licensing fees for these images. Now, there has been some change on that recently, positive change, so it's a lot more easier right now. I don't have to pay an arm and a leg and a big pot of sauerkraut in order to show you these images, but there are still some restrictions in place, which means that in the future, you're going to be seeing more original files, which is awesome, but not all of the, of the files that I pay, uh, take pictures of and not all of the images that I have can be shown. But it's a move in the right direction that I definitely appreciate and I hope you do as well. So although this is just an instructional mission and theoretically speaking it could finish right here with the preparations done, it actually does play out the attack in full, giving us sort of a template to discuss of how they would be happening. So let's do just that. The crew is assembled at 0415 hours. Takeoff is then at 0436 hours with the Staffeln and command flight taking off at intervals of 30 to 45 seconds. The code names are the following. The Stab is Kommissar, vierte Staffel Sago, fünfte Staffel Riese, sixte Staffel Puma, the ground base is Irene and the fighter escort commander is Zinnober. The planes gather in a lazy left hand turn 500 meters above the airfield, deploying in a large VIC formation made up of the individual Staffeln. They follow a path largely northeast, climbing to 3500 meters. They meet their escorts above the escorts airfield and climb to 4,000 meters in a climbing right-hand turn from 0458 to 0508 hours. At 0508 hours, the formation turns towards the target. Once close, the JU-87s throttle back to idle power and glide to mask their approach. I assume the fighters do the same because otherwise that might defeat the purpose. The formation glides downwards by 1,000 meters with the sun to starboard. The formation then turns to the southwest, dive brakes are deployed at 3000 meters with a dive heading of 200 to 220 degrees against the wind in a 70 degree dive. The sirens are not used. And yes, it literally says the sirens are not to be used. Probably to keep the element of surprise, but at the same time by 1943 the sirens were considered to be pretty much useless by anyone except the higher command structures and even they were starting to really not consider their usage to be all that important anymore. And please, now I know you all know this, but this is for that one person, that one person right in the back. Yeah, you see him as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, just right in the back there with his headphones on, pretending to be awake, but already dozing off. This is just for that person. They were not called the Jericho Trumpets. The sirens were not called the Jericho Trumpets. Can we please stop calling them the Jericho Trumpets? Never mind how many documentaries tell you that, how many books written in, I don't know, the 60s or 70s tell you that, never mind how many other YouTubers tell you that. I go through these archives, I go through these original files, and I have yet to find a single mention 
of the time between 1939 to 1945 of it being called the Jericho trumpet, this siren business. It is called Sirene, siren, or Lärmgerät, noise device, not Jericho trumpet. Now the Germans do have a Jericho Gerät, which are whistles that were attached to the fins of bombs. They were roughly yay big, yeah? And those were called Jericho Geräte. Sirens were not called that. I know you all know that. I know I've said it before, but really, it keeps turning up in my comments section. I just want to make this clear to that person all the way in the back that they're not called Jericho Trumpet. So let's, let's not call them that and let's not just repeat what the History Channel tells us, shall we? The Staffeln and the Command Flight dive in succession, dropping their bombs at 800 meters. This is the signal for the infantry to begin the attack. The Stukas pull out of the dive to avoid a violent pilot ground machine interface and use the speed to climb back to 800 meters. Because of their heading, they are also already directly over their own front lines. The grouper then rallies behind the front lines where the lead flight cuts back on the throttle and they make a beeline to their own airfield. Now mission reports are then to be filed after 15 minutes of landing with the group once, once again being ready to go on their next mission within 45 minutes. And at this point, they are not going to be supporting the infantry division that has now crossed the river and is in, engaged in combat on that hill in, with the defensive fortifications or that maybe has already uh, pushed onwards from that. No, the Stukas are now doing what the Germans call Mittelbare Unterstützen, which I'm going to very quickly translate here is indirect support and they're going to be attacking points of interest uh, for example com uh, communication or uh, logistical or infrastructure hubs uh, that are in the area in order to slow the, uh, the drawing in of uh, reserves coming in to plug that hole that was achieved by the infantry division, division and maybe at this point already to attack these reserves directly or to soften off positions that are going to be attacked eventually sometime throughout the day by the Germans or whatever, but they're going to give indirect support at this point onwards. And of course, the Panzer Division and the uh, Motorisierte Infantry Division that is on standby are also now st probably starting to sort of get into their gears and start pushing through that break in that the infantry achieved in order to achieve that full penetration. Then, of course, loop around as the, 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 as the actual plan in, uh, envisioned, right? So we don't know if that happens. The file essentially stops here. And there you have it. Yeah, a textbook example of how the JU-87 was conceptualized to be used by the Germans as taught in the Luftwaffe academies in November 1943. Of course, at this point, the JU-87s are already, um, they're already switching over to low-level attacks. They're being completely substituted by FW-190s and the ones that are remaining are started to be equipped with those anti-tank guns. So, yeah, this gives you an idea of how it was done between 1939 and 1943 perhaps, but at this point it really isn't done this way anymore, which just shows once again that curriculums then and now have a time lag. I thought that would be look a little bit more dramatic, but yeah, I want to thank at this point Dr. Roman Töppel for his help with this video. I also want to thank the fantastic support by people over on Patreon and the channel memberships who make these videos possible. And I wish all of you a fantastic day. I hope that you have nice and supportive people around you. Surround yourself with friends. Have a fantastic weekend. Check out the book if it interests you. And as always, see you in the sky.